want to take a minute and look into the camera and say welcome to everyone that's joining us online, wherever you are. If you don't live too far away, why don't you come on down? Because you miss out on some great worship. And um, we were created to be in community. And if you're looking for the perfect church, just drive straight past at 40 k's and go to the next one. Uh, I've met the staff at this one. And... Um, But you were created for community. But anyway, we're grateful for that you're joining us online as we join, uh, jump into four, part four by his spirit. Come on, Causeway, can we welcome them? Yeah. Cool. If I was to teach on the Holy Spirit in depth, we're doing five weeks, one more to go, um, it would take me six months. Every Sunday for six months. In fact, I could probably longer and we would do the introduction the person the trinity the holy spirit and the word the baptism the holy spirit um, don't get done over in the terminology the holy spirit and the believer um, and then the spiritual gifts and all the spiritual gifts there's a sunday each on each of the gifts and uh, it's a huge subject but we just want to do forward whet your appetite and we've called it by my spirit so father heavenly father I thank you for the worship this morning. And Father, I, your Holy Spirit's here. And I just pray that he just permeates in a fresh way this morning. Right through us. And we leave here changed. I just thank you for all those who have served. They've set this place up. They'll pack it down. The kids' ministry, uh, car parkers, welcomers, um, the serving on the desks. There's so much goes on. The technical team that bring my voice to the church uh, and all the thousands of leads that they plug in every Sunday. Uh, you see it. <laughs> They're glorifying you through their, through their hands. We pray you bless them and we pray you bless this time. And wherever the word's being preached in New Zealand today, there you are in the midst of that. And, uh, and Father, we need your word today in this nation. And we just pray that in the precious name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Zechariah 4 verse 6 has been our foundation verse for this. And um, it says, So he said to them, uh, This is the word of the Lord Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel? Who's named their kids that? <laughs> Probably not recommended. In fact, I was intrigued the other day. Um, uh, the, the, the number one name in Ireland at the moment, the number one baby boy's name? Muhammad. Not by might, nor by power. I want the church to say it with me all together. But, says the Lord Almighty. Come on, come on, put a bit of Lord Almighty in there. Come on. But by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And that's the foundation passage for this series. Um, we don't want to be on this faith journey under our own strength. I've done that. Done work. And I'll share a little bit about that this morning. But not by my might, not by my power, our effort, but instead God offers us his Holy Spirit. There's something more by his Spirit. And this is an Old Testament prophecy, but it's actually relevant to the New Testament church. And we covered in the Old Testament word for spirit is ruach. Got to put a Hebrew hoik in there. Hoik. Ruach. And the New Testament word for spirit is pneuma. And I love power tools, pneumatic tools. And which literally means the breath of God. Whew. Literally means the wind of God. God wants to breathe on you and take us beyond our natural into the supernatural. And uh, in week one, we talked about a, a, a spirit-filled prayer life. The Spirit-full prayer. We talked about the priority of prayer, the plan of prayer, the power of prayer. Holy Spirit-empowered prayers that are unified, biblical, and bold. Um, love to see you 6, 15 a.m. on Wednesday mornings. Man, the last two, two Wednesdays have been off the charts. And you, some of you missed out. I'm really sorry. And then week two, being filled with the Holy Spirit. And there's been quite a bit of wonky teaching in the church. Well, not, the, the Holy Spirit's not weird. I've just told you that there's weird people. You all know somebody who's sitting next. <laughs> a 
Last week, Pastor Ann. Now, come on, guys. The, you know, I get the fan mail and she gets the superstar mail. Okay, like, there must have been a hundred emails. Oh, Pastor Ann, how wonderful. Oh, it was just so good. And it's like, okay, Lord, deal with my jealousy. <laughs> and just, uh, it's not enough to believe. God has more. And, uh, and, and we need to get to know the Holy Spirit and then we need how to walk in his power. And she had some brilliant symbols. And the one that lit me up was the dove. Because I remembered that Jesus' parents brought a dove as an offering. And, uh, and, and the oil and the breath and the wind and the fire. And we might touch on the fire briefly this morning. So today I want to lay down another a foundation. And we're talking about a spirit-shaped life. We're talking about a spirit-shaped life. How the Holy Spirit, how that wind, how that breath whoo, wants to come on us, inside us, fill us with his power, and then change us, transform us on the inside. And then what happens that inside then becomes visible to others on the outside. How good is that? 2 Corinthians 3 verse 16. But whoever t someone turns, when, sorry, but whoever, whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. I love the, how the veil was torn at Jesus', Jesus crucifixion from top to bottom. Um, the, the veil is talking about, in this context, unbelief or just not knowing God. And I don't know, you know, I didn't, did you know there's a God who loved you? And did, you, didn't, you didn't know that God had things for you to do? And, you know, I'm busy doing my own thing. And I didn't realize God had something better for me. And in that moment, that veil is taken away and our lives are changed and our vision statement, is, we call it no God. And it's, it's about salvation. And then it goes on and says, the Lord is the Spirit. And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is, wait, brave heart. Without the kilt. There is... Maybe you should just stay at home. <laughs> Wherever the Lord is, there is. So all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord and the Lord who is. It's the Holy Spirit that does that. That wind, that breath, that power. Here's the takeaway for today, carrying on in the verse. And he makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Oh, 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 oh. God wants to do a work inside you to bring that power on you and in you. I didn't use the word baptism of the Holy Spirit there. I just said on you. And in you. Don't get screwed up in terminology. And don't wear the badge of the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a badge of honor. Because I've seen that. God ain't into that. I'm better than you. Uh -uh. Wrong. God wants to do a work inside you to transform you into his image. And the Holy Spirit wants to shape our lives. When you look at the book of Acts in the Bible, you see a, a group, a whole group of people, men and women, who have spirit-shaped lives. You see ordinary people radically transformed. And I love it. Jesus starts with this bunch of no-hoping rejects. Some of them were fishermen. Some of them were tax collectors. Some of them were losers. And in three years with Jesus, you, you actually see the disciples actually struggling. Because he's got to say, hey, they say to him, hey, Jesus, we, we didn't get that. Who was in that class at school? <laughs> and Jesus would teach these guys and like, duh. But from Acts 2 onwards, the same men and women 
literally transformed by the Holy Spirit. Oh. And they have this new boldness and, the, and all these miracles are going on and they, uh, thousands are saved and my, my um, daughter and son-in-law are up in, in Idaho at the moment staying with Anne's brother, Jeremy, and his church just baptised 102 people this week. This is happening, man, around, it's a big church, but it's happening around the world. Um, I was talking to Pastor Don McNally, who actually wanted to come and preach this Sunday, but I said, no, you're not good enough. And... Um, <laughs> That's not quite true. He'd just been preaching in the Gold Coast. He said 180 young people turned up at the prayer meeting. Not looking anywhere in particular. Just, just scanning, the, just scanning the, cor- the, the congregation. 180 young people turned up at the prayer meeting. Because the, 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 a few nights before, they'd seen the supernatural of God. Oh, it's going to be a loose Sunday today. <laughs> and we see uh, in Acts chapter 2, we see people living in community, in unity, and in generosity. Totally, radically transformed. One vision, one purpose, to spread the gospel of Jesus around the world. And this new movement, which was called the people of the way at the time, this thing had momentum and they had ugly, ugly opposition. Let's pick it up in Acts chapter 11. The disciples were called Christians for the very first time at Antioch. Um, the word Christian only appears in the New Testament three times. And th- that means they were followers of Christ or Christ's people. And the work of the Holy Spirit was so transforming in their lives that these people now reflected Jesus. Spirit shaped life and God hasn't changed he still wants to do that today that's his goal it's called a spirit shaped life and the work of the Holy Spirit and what he wants to do inside of you hasn't changed and I just see a room full of potential regardless of how young you are or how old you are some of you know this story, some of you don't know this story. Um, when I go to the Artificial Limb Centre, there's this question you get asked, how did you lose your leg? And then they answer it, motorbike. <laughs> okay, well, it wasn't very funny, was it? <laughs> so I, I was pillion on a bike at the age of 13, got cleaned up by a car, and I lost my right leg completely. M- missed the first six, two, two days, three days before college. Form three. I don't know what that's called today. Year nine. This year stuff's confusing, isn't it? <laughs> Form three is easy. I know what that is. So I missed the first six months and I started college on crutches with no artificial leg. And if you go up the, college, up the hill to Wellsford, the bus used to drop us at, the, at, at School Road. Right, There used to be a school there. They just torn it down, but there used to be a school there. And as I came off the bus, I was different. So there'd be 100 kids kind of waiting there. Primary school kids. I remember this nurse getting on her knees when I left hospital because I was in a wheelchair. And she said, Colin, the hardest thing you'll have to deal with is people. And I thought, ah, oh, 13-year-old kid, she don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> she was right. People can be cruel. And these kids were there and they would say, oh, there's the boy with one leg. And I tell you, it got to me. But I had a, 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 pre, a special group of mates they worked out the ringleader. She gave him a hiding. <laughs> Dragged him across the college, up to the college outside the principal's office. He was bawling his eyes out. Then the suddenly the group just diminished because they, see, that's law and order. I'd be a good police minister. And my sport had gone, um, I loved cricket, um, thought I was good at cricket, and all, it all had gone out the window, tried a few things, but, but didn't happen. But I noticed this, this little group of guys sort of got around me, they would carry my bags for me. We, we were into the lower class, so we got there quickly, we didn't have to go to the higher class, and this, this young guy who stood beside me, 
year after year after year and carried my bags for him. His name was George. And uh, sadly, he, he died and, um, at 51, I think. And, um, and, but these other, these other guys just helped me. And I didn't realise that I was looking at his spirit-shaped lives. George was a little rough around the edges. <laughs> I, I, I had to help him. And... Um, See, it wasn't a sermon that led me to Jesus. It wasn't a church. It was the lives of my new friends. And they were living out their life in front of me. And I didn't realize that. I didn't know. They were just reflecting Jesus with a little bit of rough around the edges. And I remember giving my life to Christ at the Maharingi College Hall. I remember I was at the back of the hall, my Honda 750 parked outside, and suddenly I was no longer at the back of the hall, I was at the front of the hall. And I know the Holy Spirit came in to me that night, it's the Holy Spirit that saves you and comes and lives on the inside, and if you've invited Christ into your heart, you've got the Holy Spirit there. I guess this series is just saying, hey, let's top it up a bit. Okay, that's really all it is. And, and then I was baptised... And then I got some wonky teaching on the Holy Spirit, pushed back a bit. But man, I had a great youth group and I had great youth leaders, probably a little bit more young adult. And uh, and then Anne met the man of her dreams. (laughs) Started an automotive apprenticeship and uh, married the boss's daughter. And, uh, and right from the day one, we, we, we came home on the farm and started cheer milking. And I don't think we ever missed a Sunday at church. Went to the little church down here. It was the closest one. And I got to teach kids' church, and I learnt the scriptures through teaching kids' church. Just studied up the night before. <laughs> but I was just going through the motions And when you start just going through the motions and you do it in your own kind of strength, you just get tired. It's my might, my power. And and then there were some bumps in the road in the the church leadership and and I thought going fishing was a better idea. I still do think that occasionally. Um, And and then I connected through a guy called um, Bob de Jong, who introduced me to his son, Paul de Jong. And, um, and it was, I attended that conference, and I shared this in the, in the, in the, in the uh, Holy Spirit, uh, sorry, the, the worship series. I was in this music thing, and, and suddenly just something happened, and the presence of God came into the room, and I'd never experienced that. You call it what you like. You can call that the baptism of the Holy Spirit if you want to, just the presence of the Holy Spirit. I knew this. I'd never experienced this before. And, um, and it was kind of then I just decided... To, that I would yield my life all in. And there was no thunder from heaven. And there's still bumps in the road. But I can say this. I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I used to be. And you have to give the Holy Spirit permission. And all access pass. So regards, regardless of where you are today, whether you're struggling here, this is your first Sunday here, you're, you're struggling with guilt and condemnation and failure and you are screwed it all up, or well, you're absolutely on fire, God wants to do more. He wants to do a great work in your life and God has more for you. And I want to read you something out of the Bible that kind of summed up a little bit where I was and maybe it might be where some of you are today. And in its context, it's in Galatians and it's... It's, Paul's talking to the Jewish Galatians and, and they, they'd kind of come to Christ but now they wanted to go back and live under the law. Galatians 3 verse 2. Let me ask you this question, Paul. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? He answers the question. Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish. That's how you win friends and influence people. How foolish can you be? After starting your new life, your new lives in the Spirit, 
Why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human efforts? My might, my power, my effort, but not by his spirit. So how, how I want to give you like three, three, just three quick points. How can I get on this journey to live a spirit-shaped life? I think just let the, Holy, let the Holy Spirit reveal. In fact, I'll go, let Holy Spirit reveal. If you want a Holy Spirit to shape your life, Jesus says in John 16, verse 8, and when he, in reference to the Holy Spirit, comes, he will convict the world of its sins and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. Now, when I, when I see the word convict, I kind of think condemnation, failure, useless. Condemnation is a word of the devil. It's not in God's vocabulary. Oh, I just read it this morning. Romans, there is no condemnation. And you're thinking, well, you know, I'm not good enough for God. You'll never be able to change. You'll never do anything great for God. You don't belong here amongst these nice people. Who do you think you're fooling? Has anyone heard those voices? Condemnation is so destructive. But the word convict, convict is actually very different. It literally means to reveal. To bring to light. In the CRC version, to give a nudge. And God is saying, if you grant permission, if you grant an all-access pass, my Holy Spirit will come in and reveal. My Holy Spirit wants to come, and if you let him, the biggest word in the Bible is if, because you can stay where you are and just harden up, He will reveal some things to you that need to change. But it's never condemnation. It's giving you, it's giving you victory and fruit. It's giving you victory, victory and freedom. Oh, yeah. And the reason Jesus went to the cross was to destroy the work of the enemy in your life. And if you will allow the Holy Spirit just to reveal the things so you don't have to live under their power. I have, uh, when you get something off your chest, it's in James 5. You know, if we just talk to our mates, you can call, confess it your sins if you want to, but in the CRC version, just talk to your mates. Immediately it comes off out of your lips. You've, it, it's lost all its power. It's a biblical principle that works. God forgives sin, but he tells us to, con- to talk to our mates to find healing. And when we find healing, what do we find? Fruit. This is good preaching. <laughs> I love it. I just feel so privileged to be here. And the reason Jesus went to the cross was to destroy the works of the enemy. And that Holy Spirit, I think, comes along gently. Like a dove. Gives us a nudge. And then if we stay in the game, that little gently kind of turns into a bit of a, a fire and it starts to refine. But it's a, it's a cool process. And we start to live a spirit-shaped life. And people start to see a spirit-shaped life. And if we get on this path, this is what the Bible says, and this is for someone here this morning. Isaiah thirty twenty one. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. That's the Holy Spirit will do that. Who needs that? Three, four, five. The rest can go home. We need truth in our lives and truth only comes from God. We're watching this, this woke culture and like anything can be truth now. No, don't get onto that column. Okay. There's this brutal story in the Bible. In fact, there's some brutal stories in the Bible. But this is really brutal. Acts chapter 5. I don't have time to read it this morning to you, but I know the story well. 
And uh, we, if you start reading through Acts 1, 2, 3, and 4, God's really moving. And um, for some reason, they're taking an offering and a miracle. Um, this has got nothing to do with us building a new church, but I'm just putting it out there. And, um, and there's this couple called Ananias and Sapphira. And they're selling a bit of land. And they bring the, the, the so-called proceeds from the land into the offering. And they say, this is from the sale of the land. Now, God's not bothered, you know, they, you need to keep some back. But they lied to the Holy Spirit. The sin wasn't in them selling their property and keeping part of the proceeds of the sale. The sin was lying about how much they received. And the text tells us they lied to the Holy Spirit. And the minute that was revealed, Ananias was struck dead. That's a pretty serious church service. So the boys carried him out and his wife didn't know about that. She comes in, repeats the same story, kapow, dead, carried out. The Holy Spirit wants us to be truthful. It says in Acts 5 verse 3, Then Peter said to Ananias, How is it that Satan has filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? Ananias and Sapphira did not allow the Holy Spirit full access. Acts 5.11, and it says, Great fear seized the whole church. It would, wouldn't it? Imagine if we're praying this morning, kapow, papow, dead. Whoa, now we really need to raise these people from the dead. Great fear seized the whole church who heard about these events. So it made the locals Facebook very quickly and then went beyond. Now there's two types of fear. There's good fear and bad fear. There's healthy fear and unhealthy fear. The fear of the Lord is healthy. This is what the Bible says about the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 14, 27. The fear of the Lord is a foundation of life. Turning a person from the snares of death. God wants us to live a spirit-shaped life. How? Psalm 119. Search me, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. All access pass. My thinking, my mind, my will, my emotions. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything, anything in me that offends you. And lead me on a path of everlasting life. What's, an, what's another name for a path of everlasting life? Free. Free. <laughs> oh, how many of you stayed up late watching All Blacks last night? Okay, I didn't. I went to bed. Holy, and here's our, pra- here's, here's our prayer. Holy Spirit, show me. Holy Spirit, convict. Holy Spirit, nudge. Holy Spirit, reveal. Holy Spirit, bring to light. I want to give you an all-access pass. No borders, no boundaries, nothing hidden. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for doing a work inside of me. Holy Spirit, show me. Second thing, living a spirit-shaped life is Holy Spirit, refine. We've been here before in Acts 2 a few times in this series Pastor Ann touched on this, Acts 2 verses 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly the sound like a blowing of violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Okay, fire refines and purifies. And God doesn't just want to reveal and show. He wants to take out the impurities. He wants, we, we've got to allow the Holy Spirit to refine. Our job is, our job is just to stay in the, in the game. Don't switch off the power. Because you know, when power goes off at home, it takes a long time to reset everything, doesn't it? All the clocks. Are, okay. Our job is to stay in the game. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19, love this. It says, do not quench the spirit. In the original um, 
NIV was written in 1984 and it says in there, it says, don't put out the Spirit's fire. When it says don't put out the Spirit's fire, what's that saying? You can. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all, hold on to what is good, reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify. That's a big religious churchy word. Sanctify just means to make you holy, to purify you into his image. It's called a spirit-shaped life. You, th- you through and through, may your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless, holy, as the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But not by our efforts, not by my might, not by my power, but by his spirit. Every impurity gone. I love the passage we did in the worship series in Isaiah 6. In fact, that whole passage is just our whole vision statement. And, and Isaiah says he sees the holiness of God And he realizes, whoa, I'm a man of unclean lips. And then the coal come down and touches his lips. I call that salvation, knowing God. And uh, his guilt's taken away. And then he kind of discovers, well, what am I going to do? And then then he says, well, they they had some jobs to do. He puts his hand up, send me. There's a whole vision statement right in that passage there. I love this passage, uh, this quote from C.S. Lewis. We're nearly done. Six minutes. And I, I, I'm not a great reader. Uh, and C.S. Lewis, I don't find the easiest to read, but I, I had to do some of his books at Bible school. And, he, and this is what he says. Imagine, I know I've shortened this up. Imagine yourself living in a house. God comes in to rebuild the house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he is doing. He is getting the drains right and he's stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. And you knew that those jobs needed doing. And so you're not surprised. But presently, but then presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts dreadfully. And doesn't seem to make sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he's building quite a different house from the one you thought of. You thought you were doing you were going to get a, into a decent little cottage. He is building a palace. And he intends to come and live there with you. C.S. Lewis. In the Galatians, we read what a, the life, a not, a not spirit shaped life, looks like. Galatians 5, 19. When you follow the desires of the sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, pleasure, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again that I have before that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. See, we need to stay in the refining process. And if God wants to work that out of us, and he wants us to give the Holy Spirit an all-access pass. And can I read to you how it will turn out? Yeah. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's our target. That's a spirit-shaped life. Stay in the process. Stay in the journey. Had a guy ring me this week. He was in a very difficult employment situation and uh, uh, quite an abusive situation. And he, he, was, he said, oh, Colin, I lost my rag. I, I wasn't very Christian. And I said some things that I shouldn't have said. And I always look for the encouragement. I said, actually, no, you were dealing with a bully. And for the first time in his life, someone stood up to him and you used a couple of words out of the Bible, but he got the message. Because he's been bullying people all his life and sometimes someone needs to stand up to him and use some words. I don't recommend that, out of the, not in the Bible, but sometimes you've got to do that. And I said, when the dust settles, just go back and apologise for your language, but don't apologise for your stand. There's a difference. I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I used to be. And right at the moment, I'm, I'm, a, I'm doing um, a 10-week man-up course. 
And one of the reasons our country's broken is because we've got a generation with no fathers and no men. And I tell you what, we need a strong church. The government needs a strong church. Doesn't want a namby-pamby church. And if we can get strong men, strong fathers, strong husbands, not only will the home change, community will change, the country will change. If I do nothing else, I just want to grow strong men in this church with a bit of God mongrel in them. There was a quote last Wednesday night when it came out from the, uh, the host of the Man Up. It really hit me. Any giant that you don't deal with today will become a giant in your kids and your grandkids. Any giant, so he's talking to the men at Man Up. By the way, the Minister of Police, Roger, Roger no, Andrew Little, he wanted to put this program because it's the most successful program in New Zealand for men into all the prisons. And the government were going to pay for it, which is you. One condition, just need to take Jesus out of it. Heard that from the horse's mouth. Any giant that you don't allow the Holy Spirit full access to will become a giant in your children and your grandchildren. I'm actually learning Maori. Your tamariki and your mokapuna. I've got two little mokapunas. <laughs> Can't wait to buy a digger for them. Actually, Anne was on the spade in the swamp yesterday. She's amazing. You, you've got no idea what this girl, she was cutting the silage bales open and then now she's just hit time up. <laughs> and go through growth track where you discover your, your purpose and start serving and put yourself in a place where the Holy Spirit can refine your life and, and, and stay in the game and, and change will happen and hang around the right people that live Holy Spirit shaped lives and it'll rub off it's not about my, your might and your power it's about by his spirit why because he's making us into a glorious image every day and let's pray that the Holy Spirit shows us any area that offends what, you, Lord you just show me any area that's offensive to you and the second prayer quickly Holy Spirit change me <laughs> take the area that I'm struggling with and make me brand new so when the Holy Spirit reveals and the Holy Spirit refines, and the last one is uh, let the Holy Spirit redeem. Redemption is exchange. Sometimes you, you buy something and they, they give you a voucher to redeem. In other words, you pass the voucher in and, and, you, and you get something. Holy Spirit redeem. One of my biggest encouragers is the Apostle Paul. His life before his relationship with Jesus, his life before he became Holy Spirit shaped, it was phenomenal. And I find it so encouraging. He persecuted the early church. He was a Pharisee. He was religious. Religious spirits are the most dangerous spirits. He stood by and watched one of Jesus' followers, Stephen, stoned to death. His name was Saul and he was, full t he was just a piece of work. Like he, would, he would fail getting into the mongrel mob. Um, he was batting on the wrong team and, and then he had this incredible encounter with the Holy Spirit. And it says in Acts 19, but the Lord said to Ananias, go to this man, Saul or Paul. He is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and the people of Israel. Now, Ananias would have said, 
God, are you having a bad day? Have you ever thought about that? Does God ever have a bad day? Don't think so, Tim. And I love this because Paul, uh, in Timothy 1.5, Paul called himself this, the chief of sinners, the chief of mongrels. So that's good news for you guys because you're all under that. If you're the chief, you're the top dog. Oh, okay. <laughs> and this guy will take my gospel and my love and my grace to the world. I'm reading a book at the moment called The Bible and the Treaty. Can I read you a, a prophetic word that was said in 1766 by a Maori prophet? I'll do my best to pronounce his name, Arama Toroa. And he said this. This is three years before Captain James Cook showed up. The name of their new God will be it's in Maori, but I'm not too good on that yet. The name of the new, their new God will be the son who was killed. A good God. However, the people will still live oppressed. I think today that's, the church is still living oppressed. And we need to become the head and not the tail. And in Acts 1 verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and all the way to New Zealand. And this Maori prophet prophesied it in 1766. Yeah. Paul went on to plant more churches than anyone else. God used him to write two-thirds of the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and from executioner to chosen instrument. Is anyone feeling good? You are a chosen instrument. We just need to all get in tune. It's called unity. And we can play some honking good cool music. Not just country. If we follow the conductor. God wants to redeem us and to use us to tell the world about Jesus. And here's my final prayer. Could have the worship team, please. Holy Spirit, use me. Holy Spirit, use me. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Amen. Amen.